A couple of weeks ago, my family and I, we went to a place in Grants Pass called Fort Vinoy Farms. It's an awesome place. We love going there each year to, to get our pumpkins. And they have like, they have kids rides. They have a cannon that shoots pumpkins at a bus. It's awesome. Uh, but one of our favorite parts of the farm is the corn maze. It is renowned for its difficulty. Every year, it takes us a couple of hours to get through it. This is actually a picture of one maze they did one year. It, it's crazy. And this is only one section. It's usually divided into two different sections. Uh, I read online that, that you, most of the time it takes about eight acres of their property. Crazy, right? And every year we go and, and we get lost and it takes a couple hours to get through. But this year in particular, when we were paying to, to enter into the maze, the lady's like, hey, the maze is really tough this year. And we're like, we know, don't worry about it. We've, we've done this before. She's like, no, seriously? I think there's some people who went in in early October uh, that aren't, haven't come out yet. Like this thing's like a black hole this year. And so she said, you're going to need a map. And she gave each of my kids a map and we're excited. We get to the entrance. They're ready and revving. And we, we enter this thing and everybody's like, we're going to make it out in record time, right? And I, like every other red-blooded American, love this because now I'm surrounded by carbohydrates. It's just an awesome experience. And my kids get to the first fork in the corn maze. There's three different paths. There's three different children. And wouldn't you guess it that there's three different opinions about how we should proceed. Now we're all looking at the same map. We all have the same goal, get out of this thing and successfully uh, under a couple hours so that we can go gorge ourselves on some cotton candy. But there's three different opinions. And so now there's arguments. And wouldn't you guess that every single fork in the maze for the next hour is arguing, backbiting, strife. There's no unity whatsoever. Asher keeps saying, there's a shortcut over here. He's my middle child. And Emberlyn's the leader. She's the oldest. And, and she says, no, guys, we need to go in this direction. I can tell. She couldn't tell. The corn stalks were 12 to 15 feet high. Nobody knows where we're at. And my youngest, she, she's a strong leader. And, and she's like, no, let's go this way. 30 minutes in, we realize two of my children are looking at the map upside down, right? So now we're totally lost. This, and, and, and like, are we ever going to get out of here? I'm contemplating just cutting through the side of the maze and being done with the whole thing. About an hour goes by. We've finally made it out of the first section of the maze. And my three kids come to my wife and I, and they said, mom, dad, what we're doing isn't working right? We, we all have different opinions and now we're exhausted and there's strife in our relationship because of this. They hand the map over and they say, will you lead us through the next part of the maze? We don't want to give up, but we don't want to lead anymore. And now my wife has the map and she's navigating us through the maze and we're making turns and moves and we're getting through there really fast. We got through that second half, which was the same size as the first in about 20 minutes. What was the difference between those two experiences? Unity. In the first half, there's all this arguing and dissension, even though we had the same goal. The second half, we had clarity, we had direction, we had unity, and we achieved our goal with efficiency. Today, we're going to look at what I believe is one of the great threats to the church. It's a lack of unity. And I've titled this message, Unity Through Humility, because I think we're going to see as we dive into Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, we're going to see Paul clearly lay out for us that if we want to have unity, it comes through individuals with humble hearts. And I wanted us to have kind of a, a working definition of what unity truly is. And so I just pulled this from the first chapter of Philippians 1. We heard this last week from Pastor Drew as he challenged us to live a life worthy of the gospel. Here's one of the ways that we do that. He's, it defines unity here. Verse 27, standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side. Notice the unity there, side by side. For the faith of the gospel. One of the interesting things about unity is it's a, it's a neutral term. There have been people who have been extremely unified to evil things. Tower of Babel, great example of that. Lots of unity, ungodly. 
And so what I love about this definition is it calls us to unity, one spirit, one mind, side by side, but it tells us what we're united to, the faith of the gospel. That's what brings us together. D.L. Moody, who is a, an author, a theologian, a preacher, and uh, he, he's the guy that Moody Bible Institute is actually named after. He had to, this to say, I have never yet known the spirit of the Lord to work where the Lord's people are divided. Like that's sobering. I have never yet known the spirit of the Lord to work where the Lord's people are divided. Do we want the spirit of the Lord to work? Do we want the gospel to move forward? Our unity affects the advancement of the gospel. And so today we're going to look at that. We're picking up again from where Pastor Drew left off last week. Remember, he challenged us to live a life worthy of the gospel. And one of the pillars he, he spoke into was unity and unifying under the gospel. Today, uh, as we get into chapter two, Paul is going to continue this line of thought. It's important for us to know that chapters were a later addition. When Paul wrote Philippians, he didn't write chapter one, chapter two, headings. All of that was a later edition. They received this as a letter and they read it in its entirety. And so he's going to challenge us continuing that, that thought from Drew's message last week on being worthy of the gospel, living a life worthy of the gospel. And the first thing he challenges us to is to be of one mind. So remember, end of chapter one, live a life worthy of the gospel. Here's where he goes. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, if there's any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, notice he starts chapter two with so, or therefore, if we want to live this life worthy of the gospel, so therefore, and he's about to tell the Philippians what they ought to do. But he does something very interesting. Before he gives a command, he puts in here what is called the if clause. Commentators and scholars will call this the if clause. They do that because you could take this out and the natural flow of the passage still makes sense. But Paul makes a point to say, if there's any encouragement in Christ, if there's any comfort from love, if there's any participation in the spirit, or some translations say fellowship in the spirit, if there's any affection and sympathy. Now, these are not, these, these are rhetorical questions. These, the, the answer to this is an, an emphatic yes. Is there encouragement in Christ? Absolutely. The God of the universe humbled himself to serve sinners to the point of death. And we are benefactors of that service. That in his death, burial, and resurrection, that we receive forgiveness. We're loved. We're accepted. Is there encouragement in Christ? Yes. Is there comfort from God's love? Absolutely. The word here in the original language for love is agape. This is the love of God that we've experienced. Is there comfort? Absolutely. The spirit is our comforter. Is there participation or fellowship with the spirit? Yes, I'm friends with the God of the universe. Is there affection and sympathy? So what Paul is doing here, before he gets to the command of how they're going to live a life worthy of the gospel through unity and humility, he reminds them of the beautiful promises of the gospel. And this is an important piece of Pauline theology. Whenever Paul exhorts us to do something or the church that he's writing to, to do something, he first reminds them of who they are in Christ and who Christ is to them. So he's about to tell them to be humble and unified. But before that, he reminds them of epic promises of God that are ours in Christ Jesus. The important part behind this is we are not changed by behavior modification. Notice Paul doesn't just say, do this, don't do that. He says, remember who you are. Remember who Christ is. And once you have a deep identity from that place, it makes obedience a joy. It's not begrudging submission. 
It's a joy because you have become a benefactor of the gospel. So he says, if there's encouragement in Christ, if there's comfort from love, participation in the spirit, if there's any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Notice what he does here. Twice in one verse, he says, be of one mind. Have the same way of thinking. The word here in the Greek for mind is phroneo. I can't roll the R to say my life in that word. If you can, just have a field day with that. Phroneo. And the, what the, the idea behind that word is how you think about God, yourself, and others. And he's saying, unity comes. The battle is here. How you think about God, yourself, and others. And he's going to expound on what does this actually practically look like in relationships? Moving on to verse three, he says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. Selfish ambition is pridefully looking out only for my own needs, wants, and interests. Conceit is is having a view of yourself that doesn't accord with reality. And so he's saying, don't prop yourself up. Don't don't make yourself the all-important center of the universe in your life. He says, don't do that, but do this. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. In humility, count others more significant than yourselves. This does not mean you and I are not significant. Remember verse one. He couches this command and a reminder of our encouragement, our fellowship, the love that we've received from God, the spirit that abides in us. He couches this challenge with a reminder of the beautiful promises of the gospel. It doesn't mean you're not significant. The cross is the definitive statement about your significance to God. But he's saying from from that deep-seated place where you know who you are to him and you know who he is to you, You can then look at others and look out for them and look at at them as though they are more significant than, than you. And he goes on and expounds further. Let each of you not only look to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. He says, look, there's nothing wrong with looking out for your own interests. Notice he doesn't say, uh, it's wrong to, he says, the problem in view here is when we only look out for our own interests to the exclusion of looking out for the interests of others. This is so important. What he's saying is, and this is a bit wordy, but when we live for ourselves, we are living to the exclusion of living for God and others. Let me say that again. I know it's wordy. When we live for ourselves, we are living to the exclusion of living for God and others. And what are the two greatest commandments that Jesus gave us? Right? When he's asked, what are the greatest commands? Jesus says, love God, love others. When we live selfishly, we live to the exclusion of living those commands out in our life. We're, we're, when we're only focused on our own interests and, and, and not looking out for those of others, it can cause us to, to become the center of the universe in our own minds. And in doing so, we're not living for God. We're not living for others. We're living for ourselves. Several years ago, uh, my wife and I, we, we went to a church and, uh, in Spokane. It was shortly after we got married. And the church was called Life Center. It's a great church. One of the first places that we ever felt really loved by Christian community. And one weekend I came in and I got to the door and it's not the greeting team that always gives me a hug and a big smile. And so I'm like, oh, okay, it's not my people. And I get into the auditorium and and I I look up on the stage as the worship team gets there and it's the guy who's kind of off key and, and I don't really like his song choices. None of them really impact me. They're not my favorite songs. And so the whole time I'm thinking, man, today's just lame. And finally, Pastor Joe gets on stage and Pastor Joe can bring it. And I'm like, finally, something I want, right? And Pastor Joe began a series that day called Follower, Seeker, Owner. 
follower, the idea in their vernacular, was somebody who follows Jesus closely. Seeker was someone who seeks spiritual nourishment from God. And owner was somebody who owned the mission. And for the next 30-ish minutes, Pastor Joe totally tore apart my attitude as he challenged me with the question, why are you truly here? You see, if I was honest that day, I was at church for Jason. Church was about Jason, the greeters I want, the worship team I want, the songs I want. I was looking out for my own interests I was the center of the universe in my own mind. And he challenged me. You're not here for the mission. You're here for you. You're not here for Jesus. You're here for you. And I think this is very easy for all of us to fall into this trap. Last week, Pastor Drew showed us this idea of the arrow of alignment. This is widely used in leadership circles. And for our context, The white arrow is the mission of God, where God wants to take us in the church. It's the great commission, right? Go into all the world, uh, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've taught you. And surely I'm with you always to the end of the age. That's the mission. But I'm afraid far too often, the little arrows inside, that's you and me, we get wonky right? Like we're not following that mission. Much like my children in the maze, there's the same goal. Let's get out of here. Everybody's got a different opinion about how we should do that. That day in church service, as I'm making me and my own interests the center of what the church should do, I was a wonky arrow. And I don't want anybody to leave here experiencing shame, but I do want to ask a question. You see, what I think Paul is doing in this passage is he says, don't be ambitious, don't be self-ambitious, don't be conceited, uh, don't look only to your others, be to yourself, be humble. I think he's saying, you know, uh, if we want unity, it comes through humility. And humility means that we need to take a hard look in the mirror. And when there's disunity, when it looks like this, it's very easy to point the finger at everybody else. But I think God, through Paul, Paul's writing in Philippians is saying, why don't you take a gander here, buddy? Like, why don't you check your own heart? How are you doing? Are you bringing unity? Are you living humbly in this community? So I want to ask, are you unified? Or does it look more like this? And if you're not sure where we're going as a church, I want it to be very clear. This is where we're going. People helping people find and follow Jesus. We chose the language of that very carefully. It's intentional. There's a generation of the church that where the gospel being spread looked like this. The church staff and pastors helping people find and follow Jesus. And the idea was you come to church, the pastor disciples you, they teach you, or the, the man or woman who's sitting in the, uh, or presiding over a class or a, a, a session will, will teach you and, and impart wisdom. And then you go home. And if you want to evangelize somebody, it means bring them to the church. And I'm not saying that's bad, but I don't think that's the only thing Jesus had in view when he said, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That's an unstoppable movement, not a meeting. And so we intentionally chose people helping people find and follow Jesus because it's not just pastors. It's not just staff leaders. It's all of us. In Ephesians 4, it says that God gave the church, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. Who's the saints? You. Me. Me. Our job as the church leadership is to equip all of us to live this out together. To help people find and follow Jesus. And here's a simple explanation of what that means. We share the gospel. And here's the gospel. Jesus lived the perfect life you and I cannot live. He lived for 30 
plus years on this earth, perfectly, always surrendered to, to the Father, living in perfect submission. And then he died the death on the cross that you and I deserve. The wrath of God is poured out on him towards uh, our sin. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. I love that verse. It shows the great exchange that happened. As Jesus died in our place, bearing our sin and the wrath of God for us, and then rose again, showing that he conquered sin, the grave, and the enemy, and confirming who he said he was all along. And when we place our faith in Jesus and in Jesus alone, we are free. We're saved. We become saints and we're given a mission. And this is the mission. And so we've been talking about since last spring, the blessed rhythms. These rhythms aren't just the latest fad or strategy in the church. This is what I hope becomes our lifestyle. This is how we make disciples. We begin in prayer every day. God, where are you at work in the world? And how can I join you in that? And then we listen to others, listen to their story, ask questions. And then we invite them into our life by eating with them, by serving them, by sharing with them. This is what discipleship looks like. That's what we're about here at Family Church. But I'm afraid far too often for churches, even with a clear mission, it looks like this. So, are you looking out for your own self-interest? And, and there's another way that disunity comes in. It isn't always just that somebody is against the direction uh, that God's called the church or they have a different motive or way to get there. Sometimes disunity is just non-participation. I'm not going to get involved. I'm just going to come. I'm not going to be a part of the community. I'm not going to be a part of the mission. Non-participation promotes disunity as well. It's a wonky arrow. And the picture that Jesus has for the church, it looks like this. Don't get tripped up on the fact that all the arrows look the same. It's not uniformity, right? The church of Jesus Christ is people of every tribe, tongue, and nation coming together with various spiritual giftings from God to work together side by side, one mind, one spirit, striving for the gospel, for the faith of the gospel, that the gospel would be moved forward. And Paul says, one of the pillars of this happening is being of one mind, being unified and unity comes through humility. So he says, take a long look. Are you selfish? Are you conceited? Are you neglecting the needs of others? Is God bringing about humility in your life or are you walking in pride? You see, we don't grow in humility by focusing on our problem of pride. We grow in humility by focusing on Jesus. And that's where Paul takes us in the next part of this passage. So he's laid out the issue. He says, look, you want to be unified? Be humble. But we can't will that to happen. We have no power to change our own pride. And so he's going to point us to Christ. That's the next piece. He says, have the mind of Christ. He says, verse five, have this mind among yourselves. Now, we can't have the mind of Christ when we're so full of ourselves, right? If I'm, if I'm all I ever think about, I, I'm not going to have the mind of Christ because Christ live a self-sacrificial life. Have this mind, look at this, which is yours in Christ Jesus. It's not like it will be, or you got to do some extra religious duties to, to achieve this thing. This is your inheritance in the gospel. This is my inheritance in the gospel. Now he's going to unpack what this mind looks like. Again, this is phroneo, same word. How you think about God, yourself, and others. And he's saying, we have access to this humble servant mind of Christ in the gospel. And he goes on and explains what this actually looks like practically lived out. Who, this is Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Now I want to I slowly unpack the next couple of verses. A lot of bad theology has come out of this passage. Lots of 
cults have attacked the deity of Jesus because of this passage. And I want it to be clear for us. What is Paul saying here? So he says, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. That word form often trips people up because the way we use form in our common vernacular of 2022 America is not what the original intent of this was, right? Many of your children took the form of their favorite superhero last week for Halloween. But it's not saying Jesus put on a God costume, okay? Here's what he's saying. The original language for form, uh, I can't even say the words, so I'm not even gonna try, but it's the true and exact nature of something. The true and exact nature of something. And we can know that that's a good interpretation by the context around this. Let's look at it. Though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. So Paul is equating this form of godliness, this form of God with equality with God. It's the same thing. He's saying Jesus was the true and exact nature of God. And he didn't cling to this. In fact, he goes on. He says he didn't grasp it. He didn't cling to it, but emptied himself. By taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. There's more bad theology that's come out of this. During the late 1800s, early 1900s in England and Germany, there was a theology called kenotic theology or the kenosis theory that basically said when Jesus became human, he gave up some of his divinity. And they used this verse to, to prop up that theology. But that's not what's in view here. It says he emptied himself. How? By taking the form of a servant. How? By being born in the likeness of men. What's in view here, what Paul is trying to communicate is not that Jesus gave up his godhood when he added humanity to his nature. It's that Jesus added humanity, that his humility is revealed by becoming, uh, coming into his creation. It's revealed by the incarnation. John 1 lays this out very clearly for us. The, the all-powerful creator God became flesh and dwelt among us. And so when he's talking through here, the theology is not that Jesus gave up his divinity and then when he rose again, he picked it back up. Jesus on earth was fully God, fully man. Theologians call that the hypostatic union. So that's some of the, the theology behind this passage. But it gets even deeper here. He emptied himself form of a servant. And that word servant there is literally a slave being born in the likeness of men, being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient. He humbled himself by becoming obedient. If we were to sum up Jesus' life in one word, it's obedience. Obedient to the point of death on a cross. Now we've looked at the theology behind this passage. But if we could come up for a second and just say, I, I really think this passage falls on deaf hearts often. Like we hear all the time, Jesus came in the flesh. God became a child and grew up to become a man. We, we hear about that so often that I think it falls on deaf hearts where we have the information, but it, it hasn't actually impacted and said, oh my word, the creator all-powerful, almighty, ever-present, humbled himself and became an infant. Like that, that should blow our minds. That's immense love. That's overwhelming grace. That's, that's ultimate sacrifice. God, the creator, came into his creation. But more than that, he allowed his creation to kill him so that you and I could be set free. And Paul says, if you want unity, it comes through humility. If you want humility, look at Jesus. God who died for sinful humanity. The cross is the definitive statement on humility. And Jesus is an amazing example of this. In the 
uh, World War II era, there was a Scottish officer named Ernest Gordon. And uh, he was on a military vessel, a military ship, and it was captured. And he was taken in as a prisoner of war. He basically lived at a, a, a death camp where people were worked until the point of death by exhaustion, lots of disease, lots of sickness, as they were building the Burma Siam Railway. In earnest, uh, one day he recounts uh, a, a day out in the field working in the middle of the jungle. Lots of sick, lots of dead. And uh, the end of the work day came as they're working on this railway. And uh, the lead Japanese officer got this group of men who were working on a specific section together and said, and, and said the day was over. He counted the tools and found that there was a shovel missing. And he said, everybody dies. We don't know who took it. Everybody dies. And so the soldiers lined up the men. They raised their rifles, aim at them. They're going to kill all of them. And one man steps forward. He says, I took it. The lead officer then comes and beats this man to death. And the rest of the prisoners pick him up, take him back and give him a proper burial. That night there was a recount of the tools and they found that the officer who counted them made a mistake. They were all accounted for. This man stepped forward and sacrificed himself for everybody else. And the conditions at the camp were so bad that these men were basically uh, savage animals. They, 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 they would beat each other and, and fight over every scrap of food. Everybody was looking out for their own interests because they're just trying to survive. But when they saw this man who sacrificed his life for them, Ernest said, I remembered a verse from scripture. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. And this man sacrificed, sacrificed transformed the camp, where now people are selling what little jewelry, watches, or necklaces that they have left to the Japanese officers to get money to buy medicine for the sick and dying. They're caring for one another. They're making the food go as long as it can. The sacrifice of one inspired everybody to not live for their own self-interest, to not live only focused on their survival, but to make sure everybody is cared for. And that's what Paul is saying here. Jesus is our example. We want to we look like Jesus. We want to be that church that's on mission. Our unity comes through humility like Christ. Have the mind of Christ. But Jesus is not just our example. He's the one who empowers us. I put it this way. Jesus is not just our example, but the one who empowers us to live with humility. The reality is we can't force ourselves to be humble. It's not the natural state of humanity. Jesus is not just our example. He empowers us to live humbly. We're going to jump back a chapter to chapter one to see this. Remember, there was no chapters originally. So this letter, it's written in the context of chapter one. And here's what he says. This is his prayer for the Philippian church. It is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. He says, look, Jesus isn't just your example. He's the one who the fruit of righteousness comes through. This humility that we're talking about, this unity that we're talking about, this is empowered to live out by Jesus. If we just look to Jesus as an example and say, we need to try really hard to live like this, we can't. We need God's power in our broken hearts, in our broken minds to transform us by the renewing of our minds so that we can have a, a proper forneo, a proper view of God, ourselves, and others and live out this unity through humility. But why is unity so important? We're going to jump back to chapter two again, and I want to close with this. Why is unity so important? Therefore, God has highly exalted him. Again, he's linking what just happened, that Jesus, uh, Jesus sacrificed himself with where he's going. God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, under the earth. 
and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Why does this matter? Because this is a reality for everybody in our sphere of influence. And our unity affects the advancement of the gospel. And as we're unified, one church aligned and agreeing under the faith of the gospel, one mind, one spirit walking in the same direction, we can move the gospel forward by the power of Jesus. I'm going to release to the campuses. Jesus loves you. So do I. All right, thanks for sticking around. I'm Pastor Craig, and I want to just encourage you that we're going to have a time of communion together. So if you were able to grab your cracker and juice, I encourage you to have that ready. Otherwise, if you can pause uh, and then come back, uh, we'll continue. And in a few minutes, we'll have communion together. But uh, I want to bring you back to the message for a moment, and we've got a transformational moment for you. Uh, And here's what I want you to think about. How do you currently struggle to be of one mind? What is it in your life that gets in the way of aligning your life with the direction that God is calling you to? Are there wants and desires that you put over God's wants and desires in your heart? So I encourage you to take some time and really evaluate, what does that look like for you? What is what, what does it mean for you to be of one mind, to, to align your mind with that of Christ? Secondly, as we lead into communion, that's really the purpose of why we do this. And at our campuses, we're, we're gathering together. And, and, and I would encourage you, first of all, if there's some people in the room with you, or if you could gather with people, I think uh, celebrating communion, uh, eating and drinking and remembering Christ together is an important thing that we should do in community. If you're unable to do that, I understand. So, so let's have community together. But I want to challenge you to use this as a time of evaluation. I believe when, when we're called to come before the Lord, before we eat and drink, that we should be evaluating. And really, to the message today, we should be evaluating our minds. Do we have the mind of Christ? Is there confession that's still necessary before I eat and drink? Is there someone I should confess to? Is there forgiveness that's not being dealt with? Is there something in my life where my mind is not in alignment with God? And he would say, before you eat and drink, come to me. Let's let's work this together. A desire for you to be of one mind with me. I want to take you back to the passage. Uh, Communion is really the the essence of it we see in Philippians 2 at verse 8 when he says, "...and being found in human form," this is Christ, "...he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death." even death on a cross, that, 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 that Christ displayed for us this incredible love for us through his sacrifice. And when we eat and drink, we fulfill the next sentence, basically, where, where it goes into verse 9, and he says, Therefore God has exalted him and bestowed in the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ Is Lord. When we eat and we drink, we are confessing, we are professing that Jesus is Lord. So as we do this, as you take your juice, as you as you drink and you eat, you are proclaiming Christ as Lord and that He will return. So I encourage you to take some time into evaluation. Let me pray over you, and then you take the time. It may take you uh, a good part of the day before you come back and eat and drink, but may this be a good time for you to evaluate. Are you of one mind? Are you proclaiming Christ? Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much. Thank you for the sacrifice on the cross that we eat and we drink today, and we proclaim the name of Jesus, that Jesus is Lord of all, Thank you, God, for exhibiting humility. That you didn't hold on to everything you could have, but instead you emptied yourself for us, God. Thank you for the sacrifice that makes our redemption possible because of the blood of Christ. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. I'll let you eat and drink when you feel ready.